The Maker by Jorge Luis Borges Forward for Leopoldo Lugones The sounds of the plaza fall behind and I enter the library. Almost physically, I can feel the gravitation of the books. The serene atmosphere of orderliness, time magically mounted and preserved. To left and right absorbed in their waking dream, rows of readers' momentary profiles in the light of the scholarly lamps, as a Miltonian displacement of adjectives would have it. I recall having recalled that trope here in the library once before, and then that other adjective of setting, the Lunario's arid camel, and then that hexameter from the Enid, that employs and surpasses the same artifice. Ibant obscuri sola sub nocte per ubram. These reflections bring me to the door of your office. I go inside. We exchange a few conventional cordial words, and I give you this book. Unless I am mistaken, you didn't dislike me, Lugones. And you'd have liked to like some work of mine. That never happened, but this time you turn the pages and read a line or two approvingly, perhaps because you've recognized your own voice in it, perhaps because the halting poetry itself is less important than the clean-limbed theory. At this point, my dream begins to fade and melt away, like water in water. The vast library surrounding me is in Calle Mexico, not Rodriguez Peña. And you, Lugones, killed yourself in early 1938. My vanity and my nostalgia have confected a scene that is impossible. Maybe so, I tell myself, but tomorrow I too will be dead and our times will run together, and chronology will melt into an orb of symbols. And somehow it will be true to say that I have brought you this book and that you have accepted it. J.L.B. Buenos Aires, August 9th, 1960. He had never lingered among the pleasures of memory. Impressions, momentary and vivid, would wash over him. A potter's vermilion glaze, the sky vault filled with stars that were also gods, the moon from which a lion had fallen, the smoothness of marble under his sensitive, slow fingertips, the taste of wild boar meat which he liked to tear at with brusque white bites. A Phoenician word, the black shadow cast by a spear on the yellow sand the nearness of the sea, or women. Heavy wine, its harsh edge tempered by honey. These things could flood the entire circuit of his soul. He had known terror, but he had known wrath and courage as well. And once he had been the first to scale an enemy wall, keen, curious, inadvertent, With no law but satisfaction and immediate indifference, he had wandered the various world, and on now this, now that seashore, he had gazed upon the cities of men and their palaces. In teeming marketplaces, or at the foot of a mountain, upon whose uncertain peak there might be satyrs, he had listened to complex stories, which he took in as he took in reality, without asking whether they were true or false. Gradually, the splendid universe began drawing away from him. A stubborn fog blurred the lines of his hand. The night lost its peopling stars. The earth became uncertain under his feet. Everything grew distant and indistinct. When he learned that he was going blind, he cried out. Stoicism had not yet been invented, and Hector could flee without self-diminution. 
Now, he felt, I will not be able to see the sky fill with mythological dread, or this face that the years will transfigure. Days and nights passed over this despair of his flesh, but one morning he awoke, looked, with calm now, at the blurred things that lay about him, and felt, inexplicably, the way one might feel upon recognizing a melody or a voice, that all this had happened to him before, and that he had faced it with fear, but also with joy and hopefulness and curiosity. Then he descended into his memory, which seemed to him endless, and managed to draw up from that vertigo the lost remembrance that gleamed like a coin in the rain. Perhaps because he had never really looked at it, except, perhaps, in a dream. The memory was this. Another boy had insulted him, and he had run to his father and told him the story. As though he weren't paying attention or didn't understand, his father let him talk, but then he took a bronze knife down from the wall. A beautiful knife, charged with power, that the boy had furtively coveted. Now he held it in his hands, and the surprise of possession wiped away the insult that he had suffered. But his father's voice was speaking. Let it be known that you are a man. And there was a command in the voice. Night's blindness was upon the paths, clutching to himself the knife in which he sensed a magical power. The boy descended the steep, rough hillside that his house stood on and ran to the seashore, dreaming that he was Ajax and Perseus and peopling the dark salt air with wounds and battles. It was the precise flavor of that moment that he sought for now. The rest didn't matter. The insulting words of his challenge, the clumsy combat, the return with the bloodied blade. Another memory in which there was also a knight and the foretaste of adventure sprouted from that first one. A woman, the first woman the gods had given him, had awaited him in the darkness of a subterranean crypt and he searched for her through galleries that were labyrinths of stone and down slopes that descended into darkness. Why had these memories come to him? And why did they come without bitterness, like some mere foreshadowing of the present? With grave wonder, he understood. In this night of his mortal eyes, into which he was descending, love and adventure were also awaiting him. Ares and Aphrodite, because now he began to sense, because now he began to be surrounded by a rumor of glory and hexameters, a rumor of men who defend a temple that the gods will not save, a rumor of black ships that set sail in search of a beloved isle, the rumor of the Odysseys and the Iliads that it was his fate to sing and to leave echoing in the cupped hands of human memory. These things we know, but not those that he felt as he descended into his last darkness.